Yeah, welcome to numerical methods. Yeah, what I like to do in this small session here is to discuss with you a little bit the Monte Carlo simulation of time discrete stochastic processes. So a little bit we are jumping back. Yeah? So in this lecture, we started with computer arithmetic, learning a little bit the basic of how the computer calculates. And then we had the Monte Carlo method. And our next section was random number generation. Yeah? And so the section that comes after that one is time discretization of stochastic processes. So taking a stochastic processes in continuous time, I extract an approximation that is a stochastic process in discrete time. And now I would like to combine a stochastic process in discrete time with our Monte Carlo method. Well, you maybe think, okay, this is a little bit trivial because a stochastic process in discrete time is just a family of random variables. Yeah? parameterized by the time discrete points. Yeah, Each time discrete point, you have a random variable. So actually, you just have a vector of uh, random variables. And we know how to do a Monte Carlo approximation on a vector valued random variable. Yeah? That's, the expectation is then just an integral in a higher dimensional space. And that's really also the essence here of the first part. Monte Carlo simulation of time discrete e two processes, and what can you what you can take away from this first part is maybe just that how you set up this vector, and that you will very quickly get a high dimensional Monte Carlo integral, you know? so uh, a high dimensional uh, space. So that's really where the Monte Carlo method then has also its advantage. But I have a second part here, yeah, which is really a little bit different, the Monte Carlo simulation of a Poisson process. And there's also a little surprise yeah, hidden in yeah, how, we, how we do this, yeah, which will link back to yeah, a result from our uh, section on, Monte, on the Monte Carlo method. Yeah? So there is some nice yeah, intuition hidden here in this part. But let me start with the Monte Carlo simulation of time discrete E2 processes. We have in the background our application you know, to motivate uh, the numerical method application for mathematical finance, specifically, for example, the valuation of a financial derivative. So um, this is the financial product yeah, that I'm first considering here. And we have the valuation of a financial derivative as our motivation. So the valuation of a financial derivative is calculate the expectation of the future value of that financial derivative. So for example, if you know the payoff, of course the payoff is then the value at that time. So you calculate the expectation of the payoff function. You have here to discount with the numeraire, yeah? Okay, I just assume you know that you take the time little t conditional expectation. And if you take this conditional expectation under the risk neutral measure associated with this numeraire. Okay, so that's the theory lying in the background. But you see, we have to calculate this expectation of this uh, random variable. So here, the V of capital T is um, a random variable. A random variable that describes the value of the financial derivative at time capital T. And many financial products are of the form that you can express this value as a function of some market observed quantity, for example, the value of the stock. Yeah, so S here is the value of the stock at time uh, capital T. So this is then if S is just um, a scalar value on a given sample path, path uh, omega at the time capital T, this is then a one dimensional, you could say one dimensional Monte Carlo integral we are calculating here. 
But for some financial products, the situation may be a little bit more complicated. And an example is the Asian option. No? So in more general applications, the V of T may have a more complex dependencies on the F capital T measurable events. Yeah, So everything that you have observed at time capital T or better up to time capital T. So the Asian option is of this form. So it pays you instead, for example, like a European call option maximum of S of capital T minus K and zero. It pays you maximum of the average of S yeah, observed at some earlier time points. Yeah? So here, the important thing is that we have not maximum of S of capital T, it is maximum of one divided by M sum over S of TI, yeah? where these observation points TI are then some regular space, yeah? for example, weekly or monthly yeah? uh, times before the maturity. So we pay the average. This is a classic option. And you see now that the random variable that enters here, yeah, we have many. So actually what enters is a vector of random variables. So this product depends on observing the stock at time T1, T2, up to Tm. So if you simulate the sample paths of the stock, yeah, like that. Okay, the stock moves up, down, a little bit up, up again, down, up, yeah. So that is one sample path. Yeah? Then this forms a vector x of omega k, yeah, uh, having all these observed values of the stock. So you see that the product depends on a random vector, yeah, a vector valued a random variable. What you also see is that the number of time steps corresponds to the dimension. Yeah? So if you have here m time steps yeah, from 0 to 1, from 1 to 2, yeah, so m observation points, then this corresponds to, to the fact that the vector is an m vector. So for this financial product, we are immediately high dimensional. So in other words, what we do here is we sample a time discrete sample path, yeah, so omega, of the stochastic process S. And we uh, yeah, observe this at discrete times. And assuming now for simplicity that our yeah, numeraire is constant, you see that what we calculate here is now the expectation of a function. Yeah, function defines the financial product of some high dimensional random vector. So the Monte Carlo approximation corresponds to an M dimensional Monte Carlo integral. So that is the financial product, the thing that I have marked in green, but the blue thing, the stocks, uh, I have to generate these random variables. This is now my model, yeah, my model for the stocks. And for the random variable S of little t, yeah, we define this through a model. So this model gives me then S at each of these observation times, yeah, capital T J, for the Asian option. And depending on the model, we this may lead to an even higher dimensional Monte Carlo integral. Okay, so how is that? So the thing is that I might use a model that has an even finer time discretization compared to the time discretization that is required in the financial product. The financial product required capital T, uh, one to capital TM. But now uh, for the model, we could, yeah, for some reasons, which I mentioned later, uh, for example, the, reduce the approximation error, uh, decide to have a finer time discretization. So create S at time T, yeah, little t, Ti, uh, which is fine. 
Yeah, let me illustrate this with an example. So this is now our model. And let me illustrate this with an example. So I consider the Black-Scholes model. So the Black-Scholes model is here. The Ito stochastic process for S looks like that, that ds is mu s dt plus sigma s dw. Okay, so that's actually a short notation. And yeah, I can explain this maybe again uh, later. So how do you find S at discrete times? For the black schultz model, we can actually give the analytic solution in terms of the Brownian motion. So, and this goes as follows. So first you see that there is here an S in front of the DT and the DW. So you could divide by S and then on the left-hand side, you have DS divided by S. If you would consider this as a classical derivative, this is the deriv derivative of the logarithm, yeah? So differentiate the logarithm, yeah, D log S is DS, yeah? The inner derivative multiplied with the differential of the logarithm divided by S. Uh, so we move to an alternative or an, a, a different coordinate system, a different variable. We move to y. y is the logarithm of s. And we have that dy is just mu minus one half sigma squared dt plus sigma d w. So in classical calculus, you would expect that you just get mu dt plus sigma dw, but in Ito's lemma, we have the second order term. Yeah, you know that dw dw is a dt. Yeah, there is a second order term and we get the minus one half sigma squared uh, dt term. If you have this, you see that on the right-hand side, um, there are constant coefficients in front of the differentials. So what we could do is we just integrate now and say now we have a time discretization, little ti. So we integrate over one time step on both sides. So I get integrate d log. Yeah? So that is the logarithm at the end point minus the logarithm at the starting point. So move this logarithm of the starting point to the other side. And then on the right-hand side, um, I have, yeah, the integral over mu minus one half sigma squared dt, where mu minus one half sigma squared is a constant. So that is just mu minus one half sigma squared times the time step size. And the integral sigma dw, yeah, you can, you could interpret it as a riemann stieltjes integral, integral, yeah? Then it would also be just sigma w at the end point minus w at the beginning point. And that's also here yeah, the case. So that's just sigma times the Brownian, Brownian increment. So then the next step is that you apply here on both sides now the exponential, yeah? So exponential of the logarithm of s yeah, is just the s. So I get my nice little formula that s at the next time point is s at the previous time point and the plus becomes uh, a multiplication when we move to the exponential. So multiplied with the exponential of my drift term plus my diffusion term. So indeed for the black schultz model, you can analytically express s at discrete time points yeah, in a kind of recursive formula. Yeah, so the next time point is the previous time point multiplied with some expression which you can calculate analytically. And inside here in this expression, yeah, what does it mean calculate analytically? Inside is still a, a random variable. Yeah, so this here is a random variable. So this is the Brownian increment. We know the distribution of this random variable. It has normal distribution with mean zero and variance being the time step size. Huh? So ti plus one minus ti. So taking now the Brownian increments, delta w of ti yeah, to be here, w of ti plus one minus w of ti. I can rewrite this Brownian increment using a standard 
normal distributed random variable zi. Ja, standard normal, mean zero, standard deviation one, yeah, so variance one. So I just need to rescale it with the factor square root of the time step size. So this is my Brownian increment. The zi's are standard normal and they are independent. So if I now plug this in to this representation for my S, I can express the S at a discrete point in time as a function of a vector of IID standard normals. So I can express here my model for S at TI plus one in a recursive form. So this is the S at TI my, uh, multiplied with the exponential of something that contains here my standard normal set i. So you could say that the vector uh, s of t1, s of t2, s of t3, and so on, the vector of realizations of my time discrete stochastic process is a function of the vector z0, z1, z2 up to z n minus one, yeah, because we started counting in zero, of my n vector uh, of my IID standard normals. So now I plug all the things together. So you see the vector of S realization at discrete times is a function of my vector of IID standard normals. And recall from our session on random number generation, we know how to generate such a vector. Yeah? Either we take a pseudo-random number sequence and populate each guy. Yeah? We could, um, or we take a corresponding uh, quasi-random number sequence in n dimensions. So these are IID standard normals, but we also know how to generate standard normals from uniforms, so the vector z0 to zn minus 1. For example, we could use the ICDF inversion of the distribution function method, and we can generate this vector then from a vector of independent uniforms. So a vector that is uniform on 0, 1 to the power of n. For example, if you go back now to the financial product, our financial product was the Asian option. We could just say for this financial product, it is sufficient just to generate the stock at the times capital TI that are needed for the financial product. So we would have that we choose the N equals to the M in the financial product and the little TI is equal to the capital TIs that are required in the financial product. And you see that the Asian option value is here at least an M-dimensional integral on 0, 1, M. So you have now all the ingredients to calculate an Asian option in our lecture. Yeah? You know how to generate uniforms on 0, 1, the power of m. You know how to transform the uniforms to normals, yeah? ID normals. So this gives the vector z. And then you have this formula that calculates the stock in the Black Schultz model out of the vector of z. And you plug this in into the formula for the financial product. And taking the expectation, yeah, Monte Carlo is just done, calculate the Monte Carlo sum, the average over these. However, as I mentioned, there may be situations where we would maybe need to have much more points, this time discretization points n, uh, than are needed for the financial product. So for example, even for a European option where you just need to observe S at a single time, say S at time capital T, it could be possible that the model 
setup requires that you have a fine time discretization to generate the S at the final time. And a reason is that you could have a time discretization scheme, which has a time discretization error. So consider the case where this thing here only is an approximation. Uh, because we made some approximating assumption. For example, in this integral here, the coefficients are not constant and we approximated this integral. Then I would maybe like to choose the time step size small. Uh, so in this situation, I would like to have a small time step size to reduce the time discretization error. And in this case, the number of time steps n may be required to be large. So it could be that even for a European option, where you just need to observe S at a single final time, to construct S at a single final time in the end, I need the full steps until this final time. So S of Tn is a function of the previous S and the Z, n minus one, the previous s is a function of the previous one and the set n minus two and so on. So you see even the last observed stock is a function of a high dimensional vector. So we are very quickly high dimensional. So Monte Carlo simulation of stochastic processes is to some extent inherently um, high dimensional, especially when we move to our next chapter, yeah, time discretization of time continuous stochastic processes. We will consider ap approximation schemes that uh, generate this. So if you need to simulate yeah, the random variable or model here and calculate the expectation, yeah, then we have an n-dimensional integral the number of n can be very large. Yeah? So if we use, for example, 100 time step, just to have a fine time stepping, we immediately have a 100 dimensional integral. And now here the remark I just made, even if you just consider a European option that depends on a single observation only, yeah? this can be a, high dimensional integral if the S of TM is constructed by many small time steps. Okay, so that was the Monte Carlo simulation of time discrete Ito stochastic processes. Uh, so you see hmm, there is a little bit transformation. Yeah, You write the process as a function of a family of random variable and you try maybe to step down until you have it in form of a function of a vector of uniforms. Yeah? So using transformation, yeah, but more or less, uh, it's quite straightforward to construct uh, this uh, vector, yeah, these, these sample vectors. My next example is the Poisson process. And yeah, we already encountered this guy when we discussed the exponential distribution. And this is a little bit different. And there is a surprising, funny um, observation. Yeah, what is the Poisson process? So here is the definition. It's a counting process. So what are we doing? So a Poisson process with intensity lambda is defined by, okay, we have a random variable capital Ti, so capital T1 is a random variable, capital T2 is a random variable. So the important thing is that here, capital Ti is a random variable. So it's a stochastic time. Yeah? So you could evaluate, for example, capital Ti of omega, that gives you some time. And what is the distribution of 
these random variables. Well, we know that the difference of capital Ti and capital Ti minus one, so the time step, this is an exponentially distributed random variable with intensity lambda. So the time step size is exponentially distributed. So you see what we actually model here is like the default events. Yeah? So an event that occurs at some stochastic time, yeah? exponentially distributed. Recall this means that it's actually memoryless. Yeah? So we have a distribution for the time interval. And then we repeat this. Yeah? So we add again to the previous time, we add another uh, stochastic time. So you can write just the Ti's as a telescope sum. So say, for example, you start with T0 equal zero. When you start with T0 equal zero, then you know that Ti is just the sum j from one to i, uh, because then I'm consistent here with the other uh, notation. So then it is tj minus tj minus one. Yeah. So the first increment is t1 minus t0, but t0 is uh, uh, zero. Okay, so you know that this is... Um, the representation of Ti. Yeah? You could say you need to add here T0, but T0 is actually zero, so you can cancel it. So you see that the, the time Ti is actually the sum of these IID exponential distributed random variables, the time steps. So my event occurs and then the process repeats. And what the N is doing, it's just counting how many times have I observed. Yeah. So S N is just counting. So I have the indicator N of little t is the indicator how many times yeah, these times are increasing in size on a fixed sample pass omega. How many times are less or equal little t, how many of these events have occurred before the time. So, and you see here below a small picture, yeah, so you have, for example, for the blue part, yeah, this period here is exponentially distributed, then the first event happens, so I count to one. And then this period here is exponentially distributed, then the second event happens, and I count to two, and so on, so I count to three. I evaluate this sequence of time increments on a common omega, this then defines the sample path, yeah, and here that the sample path was omega 2. Well, the same for a different one. So this period is exponentially distributed, event happens, event happens, event happens, I count to three, a four, and a five, and this defines then my sample path omega. So this is the uh, Poisson process, yeah, some counting process, some event happens, yeah, like, for example, decay in a radioactive material, yeah, so you observe uh, events at uh, stochastic times. Yeah, how do we do now the Monte Carlo uh, simulation of this stochastic process? Before I do this, let me just complete the definition. Inhomogeneous stochastic, uh, inhomogeneous Poisson process. Well, this is just that instead of lambda being a constant, I now have a little lambda of t. Yeah? So lambda is a function of time. So it may vary. So this alters the exponential distribution for the time intervals. But recall what we had for the exponential distribution when we did this in the other session. There, the lambda times t in the exponential, exponential yeah, minus lambda times t, was replaced with the integral over lambda of little t. Yeah? So lambda times t is just the integral of the constant. And this is also what is happening here. So we have the integral of lambda of SDS appearing, and this is just re-parameterizing time. 
Yeah. So we actually move to a new time by reparametrizing time on a Poisson process that has intensity one. So replace the lambda times t or the one times t, replace that now with your capital lambda of t with the reparametrization of time with this um, integral. Okay, so how do we now create a Monte Carlo simulation? So drawings of these sample paths omega uh, for the Poisson process. So in the previous example, and this is now interesting for the Black-Scholes model, we considered a fixed time discretization. And we sampled on this fixed time discretization, the random variable S of Ti. So my random vector S of T0, S of T1, well, S of T0 is a constant, so I can leave it out. So my random vector S of T1 up to S of Tn was fixed to be of dimension n. So the fixed time discretization implied a fixed dimension for my random vector. For the Poisson process, this approach is, well, only useful if you are interested in n of ti, so at fixed times. So if you go back to the picture, this means that this means that you are just interested in how many jumps have occurred before these times. But this is not what is usually interesting in the application. In the application, you sometimes have a function that really depends on when did it happen. And of course, also how often did it happen, but you need the exact times, yeah? this time, this time, this time. So having the need to need the exact times, I cannot work with a fixed time discretization. And you already see a subtle thing here. If you consider a fixed time horizon, which is maybe reasonable, yeah? so that you say your financial product lives up to this point, then some sample paths have more jumps, more times than others. Yeah? Here, the red one has five times. The blue one has three times. So often one is interested in the specific jump time of n within a given interval from zero to capital T, so some time horizon, the final maturity of your financial product. And we now create the samples of n as follows. So the Poisson process is built from these IID random variables with exponential distributions. So this is actually my ti minus ti minus one. So let's call these guys zi. So here the set i corresponds to, in my telescope sum, the ti, ti minus one. Um, so create a sequence of iid exponential distributed set i's and then define the t k as the sum i from 1 to k set i. And then you just check that you stop summing if the tk becomes larger than your time horizon. Then you have sampled all jump times up to time capital T. If you have sampled these times tk, yeah, then you can just calculate the n at any given time little t by just checking, yeah, you just search, yeah, how many times do I have before? So you have that your little n is just the k, yeah, where the k is just defined by what is the stochastic time that is the last one 
before, yeah, so the last one, less or equal your given little t. You just count yeah, how many times are before. So for the given time horizon capital T, you sample the jump times Ti up to time uh, capital T. So this means that I have here some uh, condition. So when do I stop? I, I, I sample nj time steps, yeah, where nj is actually then the last time that is just less or equal my uh, time horizon. Yeah? So this nj here is interesting because the j is the index from my omega. Yeah? So this here is an n of omega j. So the number of jump times that you observe up to a given time horizon is different on different sample paths. Maybe we look at an implementation of this. Yeah? Uh, I could just write this uh, live with you, but it's not so complicated. And we maybe just look at the given code. So there is an implementation here in our lecture repository. Now we jump back to the package Monte Carlo and there is in Monte Carlo Poisson process here this nice little Poisson process experiment. So what we do in the first part is yeah more or less what's written here in exercise eight, implement an algorithm that takes given time horizon T and also the given number of sample paths N and also the given intensity parameter lambda. And then it should generate a list of N sample paths. So I collect now N sample paths in a list. And what are the elements of these lists? The elements of these lists are now a list of jump times tk of omega j, yeah, sorted by jump times. And each jump time then represented as a floating point double. So the object generated is then a list, yeah, my list over all omega j's of a list, yeah, my list of all tk on this omega j of floating point doubles the times. So I would like to generate this um, object. Yeah, here are my parameters. Let's generate 1000 sample paths, the omegas, up to time capital T being 10 with a lambda of uh, 1.0. So what do we do? We allocate our list of list of times. Uh, so this is just a list. And we iterate over all omegas, so loop over all path indices, uh, the j's, up to number of sample paths. On each of these sample paths, I now allocate a list where I collect the times. So we initialize the time to zero. So this here is my capital T zero. I initialize this to T zero. And this is my time, which I'm now summing, yeah, where I'm, I'm now summing these time increments. So as long as my jump times is uh, smaller than the maturity, I generate now an exponentially distributed time. Yeah? So this is here, sample and exponential distributed time step. So how do I do this? I use the inversion of the distribution function method. I take a uniform random number. Okay, you see, I have created a random number generator here that generates uniforms. This is Mersenne Twister, one dimensional. I generate a uniform distributed random number here and I create from that the exponential distributed time step. Uh, it's minus logarithm of u divided by lambda. 
So this is my time step. So the next jump time is just the previous jump time plus this time step. Yeah? This is now my partial sum. If this guy is, yeah, actually here there should be less or equal maturity, then I include this in my list of jump times. If not, I have jumped out of my time horizon interval uh, and I can then stop. Yeah? So I can then stop. So the last time I would include is exactly time horizon, yeah, but at, at that time I would not generate a new time step again. Um, yeah, then I have generated the inner list of jump times, yeah, the T1 of omega j, the T2 of omega j, and so on, yeah, on a fixed omega j. So I just add now this list to the collection of all the jump times. Maybe I print this, what we are doing here. So let me print here the jump time that we have created. Maybe also a comma for separation. And after we have generated a sample path, let me print a new line so we generate a new line for each sample path. Yeah, let's maybe run this little part. There is another part here, which let, let me comment this out for a moment. Yeah, I will comment on this later. Let me run this little program. Okay, and you see that he's generating here many different sample paths with our random times. Yeah, 1.8, 2.7, 3.4, yeah, uh, increasing times. And you see that we stop when we have jumped over the time horizon. You see that here I only edit if I'm before the time horizon. So in this list here, you will also see the last one that is not added to my list. Yeah, Believe me, this guy is not added to the list here. It is but it is the last one uh, generated and then we stop. So interesting is that if you take a look at here, the samples we do, we stop at different times and we stop after different number of times. Yeah? So sometimes we have, for example, very large jumps. There is here a jump from three to 11 yeah, or here, you know, you have a jump from six to 10. Yeah, so sometimes you get very quickly to the end, and then you have very few times in your sample path. But sometimes there are also very small steps here. For example, if you look here, this line, okay, yeah, it has many small time steps, yeah, and it is quite, quite long. Yeah. So the interesting thing is that it looks as if the dimension of the random vector is changing. The dimension is stochastic. Yeah. So what is the dimension of this stochastic integral? Yeah, this is here a funny observation. Assume now that we have a financial product and this financial product depends on the jump times that occur before maturity. For example, I have a contract that runs 10 years, and whenever a device in your car fails, I pay you some fixed amount. So assume the failures of this device or the replacement of this device is exponentially distributed, yeah? so they fail just at a random time. So I'm exactly in this situation for a time span of 10 years. Yeah, I pay you amounts at random times, and I do not know how many amounts do I pay you over these 10 years. So this means that my financial product is a function of a set of these random times generated by my model. It's a function of a random vector that has variable lengths. Yeah. So what is the dimension of this Monte Carlo integral that we are calculating here? So we see that the function f depends on a 
valuable number of stochastic times. Yeah. So what is now the dimension of the Monte Carlo integral? Well, and now I can come back to when we started the section on Monte Carlo. And we had this little comment, well, how is a vector uh, or how is a drawing uh, modeled? So we had this little comment, how is a drawing of a random variable modeled? And you see that a drawing of a random variable is actually just a single random variable on the product space. And linking this to the way how we generate a random vector out of a one-dimensional sequence. So this was here. If you have a random vector with IID components, you can just take a one-dimensional sequence of IID uh, random variables and populate the components one by the other. You see that the Monte Carlo integral really doesn't care about dimension. So the dimension of each of these vectors here could be different. So that's also the reason why Monte Carlo doesn't suffer from the curse of dimension, but because he just doesn't care about dimension. Dimension is just take a, a number of elements from this vector. And you see that we are doing this exactly in our implementation. What I do is I have a one-dimensional random number sequence, and I just take as many elements I need, and then I jump to the next element, yeah, the next sample uh, pass omega. Yeah, and I have taken maybe an n-dimensional vector, a five-dimensional vector, a four-dimensional vector, yeah, variable dimension. Very funny, very interesting thing. So we see from the implementation, and this is also a comment, yeah, maybe uh, I like to make this comment. Uh, sometimes I like thinking in implementations because when you know what the implementation is doing, this provides you maybe a little bit more intuition. And you see in the implementation, what we do is we actually just have a sequence of one dimensional uh, random numbers. Yeah? So we just have a one dimensional integral, you could say, yeah? but we take a variable, um, um, number of these. So we see from the implementation that we just need to generate a single one-dimensional sequence of exponentially distributed uh, random variable, random numbers. And when we reach the maturity, yeah, the sequence switches to the next uh, sample pass. So similar to the method how we generate a random vector from a one-dimensional sequence. So by the way, this also implies that sampling now our Poisson process with a quasi, quasi random number sequence is not so trivial because this trick of taking a sequence of IID random variables and populate the elements one by the other is not allowed for the quasi random number sequence. There we have to ensure independence by specifying a specific dimension. So you could say, okay, you take a hundred dimensional uh, quasi random number sequence, then populate the elements one by the other, uh, and maybe just cut off you know, when you have more than 100 time steps. Okay, so that's a funny, interesting thing. Let's continue with the Poisson process, you know, maybe worth noting is that yeah, my Poisson process jumps up. Yeah? So he counts how many events do I have. So it's continuously increasing. But we already know that lambda has an interpretation. Yeah, Lambda is the frequency. Yeah, um, So lambda times t is then the amount of jumps we um, expect. So maybe not surprising, we have the result that the process M, that is N minus lambda of T, yeah, this is a martingale. 
Uh, so if we start initially with our account being zero, it means that the expectation of this M of T yeah, is zero. So the N will always jump up in discrete steps, yeah, one, two, three, but the uh, lambda will then gradually pull it down again. Yeah, so and the minus lambda T is compensating the Poisson process is also then called the compensator. So this guy is a is a martingale. Maybe I like to um, implement this. Yeah, maybe let's simulate the MT from this lemma. So how would we do this? So maybe just continue here. So now I have generated my array of jump times. So the next thing is that I would generate the N. So here I actually generate the M of T, which is the N of T minus lambda T. So you see here I have the minus lambda T, but maybe I just comment this out for a moment, Yeah, the minus lambda T. Then this code here will generate the N. Yeah, how do we do this? Yeah, what I would like to do is I would like to generate N for a fixed time. Yeah? So in M of T or N of T for a fixed time T. Yeah? So T equals time. So this is a function. Yeah. So given a little t, I would like to have all the values of M uh, or N on my sample path. So the return value of this function is a vector, vector of values, uh, having number of sample path entries. So I would like to calculate this vector. So you see that actually I generate here a random variable object so if you, you if you take a look into this implementation this is now an implementation of a random variable but this implementation is just taking this vector here and if you take a look storing it internally so the story about uh, behind this class yeah we will discuss this maybe later is just that it mm, encapsulate a few operations we like to perform on the random variable. For example, if you look for the average, it can calculate the expectation of this random variable. And it does this, for example, with Kahan summation, which we learned in our section on computer arithmetic. The reason why I use this here is because I have a fancy little helper that can plot the sample path for a given function that maps time to the random variable, the vector. Yeah, how do we generate this vector? I allocate the vector of sample paths, then I loop over all sample paths, and now I just count, take my list of the sample paths, take out of this list the corresponding J's sample passed. So the result of this get here is the list of times. From these times, create a sequence out of which you remove all the elements that are larger than times. So filter everything that is below the given time and then count the number of elements. So this little line here is just counting how many of my stochastic times are less or equal the given time little t. And this is then my n, my n on the corresponding sample path. So I just add this here to this count. Yeah, then here below, I have a small function that creates a plot. Yeah? So maybe I can comment this in again. Uh, and we can create the plot. Okay, so this is what my algorithm has generated. Yeah, the main part of the algorithm is here on top where we generated the stochastic times uh, by sampling 
the time increments as exponential distributed random variable. And you see, sometimes yeah, we jump up yeah, very, very late here. And sometimes we jump up very quickly. Yeah, this guy is observing many, many events, yeah, up to 18 events. Yeah? So the dimension of my vector here is between, say, three yeah, and 18. Yeah? Sometimes I observe only three times. Sometimes I observe 18 times. Now let's modify my count by subtracting lambda times t. Let's create the picture of this guy. Yeah, this is now the compensated Poisson process. Actually, these are the same sample paths. Yeah, so you see, this is still the same guy that jumped up to 18. But now everything has this slope lambda yeah, going down in between. So my compensator. And you see, yeah, indeed, indeed, this looks like being a martingale. Yeah. A little bit symmetric here. Um, this compensates the Poisson, Poisson process. Yeah, this is then the compensated Poisson process. Okay, so maybe you can study this little experiment here. So again, as always, you can check this out. So this is the Poisson process experiment. Now we have the package Monte Carlo Poisson process. Yeah, so Monte Carlo simulation of stochastic processes again in our lecture uh, repository. So we did exactly what we have here. So for a given maturity, we collected the jump times, we generated the jump times. Out of this set of jump times, we generated our counting process as a function that maps t to a random variable. And we also plotted this. Yeah, so the Poisson process also helpful and also an important uh, method. And the interesting thing here is really this uh, yeah, a little observation that it corresponds to Monte Carlo integral with a stochastic dimension. Yeah, you could interpret it as a Monte Carlo integral with a stochastic dimension, but Monte Carlo doesn't care really about the dimension. Let me conclude with two small remarks. Yeah, the remarks um, on low discrepancy sequences, I already made this. Recall that we are now in high dimension and why I mentioned that Monte Carlo doesn't really care about the dimension. If you move from pseudo-random number sequences to quasi-random number sequences, you have to explicitly use a sequence of the correct dimension. Having observed for the Eto-stochastic process that the dimension can be very large, a hundred dimensional integral, uh, this means that we have to use a high dimensional low discrepancy sequences. And this is yeah, really uh, an issue that this is not so, so easy. Also recall that the convergence rate, so we had for the Horton sequence, logarithm of n to the power of d divided by n. Yeah? So this logarithm of of n to the power of d was killing a little bit the advantage of the divided by n uh, when comparing it to the classical Monte Carlo, the one divided by squared of n, if you consider a fixed n, uh, a fixed number uh, of sample paths. Okay, so for the Eto stochastic process, the number of dimension is associated with the time step size. And for the Poisson process, it is to some extent not even determined. So to summarize for the Plex-Scholz model, when we started, we could represent our time discrete stochastic process analytically as yeah, a function of our independent Brownian increments. So for general stochastic processes, 
the solution, the analytic solution of the stochastic process at fixed times is maybe not known. So in this case, we have to rely on a time discretization scheme. So an approximation method that associates our time continuous stochastic process with the time discrete stochastic process. So since this is an approximation scheme, this often demands that we use many fine time steps creating a high dimension. And yeah, this is what we will consider now in the next chapter. So my next chapter is time discretization of stochastic processes. Yeah. So it has nothing to do with random numbers, nothing to do with Monte Carlo. I just look at a given stochastic process in continuous time. How can I generate the stochastic process in discrete time? But from our session today, you know how to move then to the Monte Carlo method because you have a time discrete stochastic process, a function of a family of random variable, if you like to calculate, for example, the expectation. That was it for today. Thanks.